Well, we are in our last lecture for digital forensics. From here on out, it's just working through cases. This final lecture is four, four smaller chapters put together into one, uh, one lecture. It's a lot of, of just like overall information that can be useful, but I wouldn't say it is essential information, for example, to help with uh, the cases that you are working on. But it's interesting stuff. Uh, for example, uh, during an installation of a, um, a mobile app, there tends to be a SQLite database. Uh, this relational database has tables that may or may not be encrypted with users contact, communication with contacts and so on. They tend to have an extraordinary amount of PII and can put an individual at risk for social engineering. These can also be subpoenaed through a third party service provider for evidence. SQLite databases are the preferred storage for mobile apps. Uh, this is a um, this is showing you what's inside of Tinder, for example. In iOS, the library folder is where you'll find all the important user data like cash and cookies. In preferences, you may find usernames and passwords stored in plain text. <clears throat> in this picture, you see the name com.cardify.tinder referred to as the bundle ID or the uniform type identifier made of alphanumeric characters to identify an app. Another form of static analysis refers to performing a code review on an application. In Android, there is a manifest file. It's actually called androidmanifest.xml, which shows the permissions associated with any particular app. So here you can see what, what WhatsApp uh, is looking for as far as what permissions it wants to have to, to run. Tools to work with Android apps are things like Dex2Jar, which turn applications, um, uh, mobile apps for Android into Java. For dynamic analysis, you want to install the application and run it in an emulator. Uh, investigators can look at network traffic with things like Wireshark to see what's happening, what, what, uh, what is this application sending out and be able to intercept the traffic. Going back to Tinder as an example, Tinder allows deep linking, a way to connect social media accounts within its own app. Using a tool like Robtex, which again is on the lecture notes, we can map out the domain, all domains associated with Tinder. An investigator can determine where app user data is being stored and then determine a, uh, the, the jurisdiction. because yeah, we see where the communication is coming from, where data is being saved, so we can make a, um, a, a search warrant at the correct location. Examining the SQLite database for Tinder does show a table that has all other users and their proximity. And it's even possible to get this deep into finding out where somebody is. Now there are lots of juicy information within those SQLite databases. So if you're ever interested in mobile security, you're going to have quite the, quite the time.
photos, switching gears, photos are more pervasive than ever and are used more frequently in the courtroom. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, they need photographic evidence. It is utmost important in the child exploitation cases. This organization and others maintain huge databases of hashed images of exploited children in hopes they will assist in rescuing missing children and prosecute the pedophiles. Law enforcement can use a hash of a photo and share that information without having to view any disturbing image. Project VIC is a collaboration of domestic and international law enforcement and private sector partners with the goal of rescuing child abuse victims, apprehending sex offenders, and securing crime scenes. Project VIC is a huge database of child abuse photo hashes that is shared among all law enforcement that can be used to create links to other investigations. Many forensic tools can connect to Project VIC to quickly identify victims using photo DNA and contribute to an existing database of victim images. Uh, I put in a couple of little case studies of, um, of using photos. But a quick understanding of digital photography. Uh, digital photographs, its definition, an image taken with a camera and stored in as a computer file, is stored in various storage media, from internal memory to SD cards to compact flash and so on. Typically, the file system utilized is FAT or XFAT, which means there is no permissions. The design rule for camera file system, or DC, DCF was developed uh, by Jada to facilitate the exchange of images between digital still cameras and other devices for viewing photographs. Digital camera images, or DCIM, is the root directory in the file system of a digital camera. It is standard protocol for all digital cameras. Uh, let's not forget that social media is a very useful uh, tool as well, because they act as huge repositories for photo images that can be incriminating or help solve a crime or even locate a missing person. The exchangeable image file format, EXIF, is the metadata associated with digital pictures and is used by most smart devices. There you'll find things like date, time, make and model of the camera, a thumbnail, an aperture, shutter speed, and other settings, including longitude and latitude. Exit data can be manipulated, so you have to ensure that the digital photographs' integrity is secured. A raster graphic file consists of a grid of pixels, the smallest element of a raster image. It could be square or it could be a dot. And it's associated with pictures found on a computer or retrieved from a digital camera. Compression algorithms are used to reduce the size of these large images. Down there, you see the file extensions that are considered raster. A vector graphic is composed of curves, lines, or shapes based on math mathematical formula rather than pixels. So that, that is the difference between the two. With all rasters, it's a grid of pixels or dots. Vectors are all math. Article 10 of the Federal Rules of Evidence is related to photographs. Ultimately, a original must be used, but in its absence, 
A duplicate can be used if it is deemed a genuine copy or one that is unaltered. A printout or other output readable by sight is regarded as an original. Comparing photographic images can be important to see if someone was using photos without the consent of the owner or prove that a suspect was distributing illicit photos. Digital photos lend themselves to all kinds of techniques to improve the clarity of the image from brightness adjustment, cropping, color balancing, contrast adjustment, linear filtering, restoration, and more. For example, uh, this picture uh, comes from Interpol when they were searching for this guy. He tried to hide himself by swirling his face. 11 days after the picture was fixed, the criminal was captured. So, so much for trying to hide because just restoring the picture was enough to catch this guy. Jumping gears again to Mac. Again, if you if you are a shop who is who is built to deal with anything under the sun, you need to be well versed in everything under the sun. If you will be doing Apple forensics, then you need to be well versed in all things Apple. For example, Apple used to have a Mac server. Uh, the history and all the versions of the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad Pro, the watch, and everything else that goes within it, like the Airport Express, the Airport Time Capsule, and all that stuff. The Mac OS or the Mac file system was introduced in 84, replaced by HFS when Mac OS X was updated with Unix, Mac can read NTFS, FAT, and X to file systems since they all have a common base. The hierarchical file system or HFS has two parts, the data fork, which consists of the actual data and the resource fork, which stored the file metadata and associated application information similar to NTFS's alternate data stream. The resource fork was deprecated as any file copied onto another file system would become a hidden file or simply removed. HFS Plus or Mac OS Extended came into the world in 98. It could handle long file names up to 255 Unicode characters it is case sensitive. It has allocation block numbers, volume headers, catalog files as well. APFS is the new file system. It has copy on write, where data is duplicated with a container regardless of the volume. The data content is not replicated and only the metadata is duplicated. This means that two files will have data content that is physically stored on the same block. APFS has strong encryption, which includes full disk encryption with single or multi-key encryption. Depending on the hardware, you have AES XTS or CBC encryption. Key bags store the encryption information, including the keys to unlock a container. These container key bags hold the volume key bags and the volume encryption key used to encrypt the data blocks. Volume bags also have the key encryption key derived from each user's password on the system and the recovery key. Along with all that, you have 
the T2 chip that has been around since 2017 that has uh, storage for some encryption information. These are inaccessible. Um, so it requires an interfacing with the chip itself. There's also space sharing, allowing multiple file systems to share the same underlying free space on a physical volume. APFS volumes or containers can grow and shrink without repartitioning. A container is, a, is comprised of a series of logical APFS volumes which share blocks from the container. Physical disks combine to form an APFS container. Snapshots are a thing in APFS volumes, so it is possible to restore file and data. A couple of interesting places for Max would be things like the uh, Spotlight. It's basically the search function on a Mac. Files that are removed to the trash and then deleted cannot be recovered as the OS no longer maintains a link to reference that file's physical location. The .ds store file will contain an indication of the files that were moved to the trash. Journaling is an HFS, HFS plus feature that maintains a backup of user files so that if a system crashes, the last saved copy of the file that will be made available to the user. DMG files are an exact copy of a file or a volume. The files within can be encrypted. A DMG file is the Mac equivalent of a DD image and can be viewed as a, as a mountable virtual disk. A sparse image is a virtual file for a Mac OS that will grow in size as more files are added. Sparse bundles are like sparse images, but are used with File Vault. Property list format files, or plist files, are configuration files, similar to the registry files found in Windows. Plist will contain a wealth of information for investigators like user and application preferences. There's also the .sleep image file. That is basically the, the Hyperville file in Windows. It has all the contents of RAM. If the power goes out, this file is read and moved back into active memory. A couple of features that as investigators we need to be aware of are things like Gatekeeper, a security feature that enforces code signing for downloaded apps before executing. The file vault that when enabled, there's virtually no helpful evidence that can be retrieved. There is a recovery key that the user is encouraged to save or print. So if that is found when you do a, um, a search warrant, when, you, when you're executing a search warrant, that could be useful. There is also an option to save it with Apple, making a contact with Apple worth a try. Disk Utility conduct, conducts all disk functions like verifying, repairing, formatting, mounting. You can also get to it through the terminal. The Mac OS keychain has is the password manager in Mac OS. And there is a file for users and a file for the system. iCloud keychains may also be available on the system if we can get into it. Uh, tagging. You can tag uh, files. Uh, this can be valuable as they demonstrate the personalization and organization of files by a suspect. Safari is the default browser and can also yield information just like Google Chrome, just like Firefox.
similar to Mac OS, knowledge of mobile devices created by Apple and the various nuances of these products is important when investigating. You know, because they'll have a lot of personalized data. They're inter often interconnected to the Apple environment. So meaning the same evidence can be retrieved from multiple devices. Because of the similarities, there is more predictability about what to expect when investigating Apple devices. Since Apple is in control of the ecosystem, it is possible to request user data and assistance from Apple. Now, will they respond? That's a different story. iOS is formatted APFS and divided into the root partition and media partition. There is a 40 digit alphanumeric identifier for each device that is hard coded into the application processor. Apple does not keep a record of group identifiers um, that it uses, but it is used to cryptographically link data to a specific device. Chip off is usually not a good option for Apple devices because these IDs are used as applications run on a specific device. So if you try to get data off of them, it probably won't work. There's the USB restricted mode. There's the possibility of getting through the Apple ID. Um, there is the iPad that also is connected to the Apple ecosystem, and that has its own OS, but it's also but it's similar to iOS. Uh, there's Apple TV. You know, all these devices are all interconnected. They share the same ecosystem. So if it's possible to get into one, you may be able to get into the others. Yeah, you could uh, see if you can get like the FCC ID in mobile devices to help understand the type of device, the hardware, and any potentially software installed. There is a site that Apple has where you can enter a serial number and determine any technical specifications. But really, encryption is the biggest hurdle in all Apple devices that you need to overcome. Because once you are able to get a DMG image of the, the drive, whether that is the phone, the iPad, the TV, or whatever, then you can open it in a read-only forensics tool. Lastly, we have a couple of miscellaneous stuff. IoT. These are devices that are connected to the internet that didn't have an internet connection before. They can be controlled by a smartphone app or remotely controlled. They have tremendous potential for us as investigators. Uh, there are some challenges like the uh, tool limitations, the vast number of different IoT devices, the non-standard formats, proprietary firmware that we have to work with. With many IoT devices, they can't just be forensically imaged or directly forensically imaged. So we have to derive information from the cloud. Five G and Wi Fi six having the right tools to investigate these devices is always a challenge to buy the latest hardware, especially right now in the chip shortage. Shodan is an awesome tool that helps you search on on their platform for internet connected devices. Virtual assistants 
they also, uh, when used, store a vast amount of information that can be used for information gathering. Same with devices like these. Exam for example, examining the frame rate in, uh, in the video and any other evidence such as view of the speedometer can help in the case. Uh, police vehicles have all kinds of, of tools and toys within them to help gather information in, a, in, a, in the start of an investigation like the body cameras, they are connected to the internet. Um, Amazon has been known to work with law enforcement to send ring doorbell data to law enforcement. Uh, the, the system that a, a, car, a cop car uses to connect is the cellular vehicle to everything. It's a 3G PP standard. It allows cars to be connected to the internet and transmit data using a, what's called a cradle point router. Helps coordinate with things like blueprints and maps, aerial views with drones, coordinate with fire trucks, situational awareness, automatic plate recognition, and so on. Uh, vehicle forensics, that is a growing field because a lot of infotainment systems save a lot of smartphone information and they're able to access uh, smartphones without the user's password or, or uh, biometrics. But lastly, let's not forget, there are low tech solutions for high tech seizures. In a search and seizure, for example, there are so many possible electronic devices and possible places to hide those devices. Think of sticking a Raspberry Pi in a wall or uh, trying to hide it within clothes or wherever, or, or hiding little SD cards or uh, you know micro SD cards. Those can hide anywhere. There is a chemical called TPPO that is typically found in all electronics. Law enforcement teaches dogs, for example, to help locate these devices. So if a suspect thinks they can hide their little micro SD card that has incriminating evidence, well, law enforcement can simply bring a dog in who's trained to find that stuff, and there you go. Sometimes the best way to go is low tech to get the evidence to solve a crime. Any questions on all this? I know I hit four different subjects in a span of 30 minutes. Well, seeing no questions. As I have said before, we are spending the rest of the semester working on these six cases. I hope you have taken my constant repetitive encouragement to work together to solve the cases. I know when, uh, for example, when I first loaded Narcos, it took me way longer than I expected it to take. I had to amp up the number of cores used in both autopsy and 
in, in Google Cloud so that it processes through the three disks quickly. Use the template that I mentioned in that one module, provide all the, the reporting from the tools, all the exhibits, everything like you would be submitting it to a court. Because remember the whole point of the report is this is you detailing what you found and the steps you took so that another investigator can repeat everything you did step by step and reach the same conclusion you did. You are absolutely welcome to reach out to me on Discord. We don't necessarily need to meet anymore Tuesdays at 11 because it's all, it's all working on the cases for the next couple of weeks. Module six has the, the section about creating a comprehensive report. If you're curious as to what I was saying. So again, work together, use Discord. You can create, you should be able to create threads. So you can, for example, make a thread for um, thread for each of the cases and work together. They are all due May 18th, along with everything else in the course. Due May 18th, I will be reminding everybody as we get, as we start getting closer to that date. Autopsy does have a way that you can have one instance be the one that has the database, the, the files themselves, and everybody else connects to that one instance. I suggest, actually better than WireGuard, I suggest using a tool called TailScale. If you wanna go down this road, one of you guys in your team would have all the files and uh, process all the files, all the, the files in the cases and everybody else connects using tail scale into that network so that you can all see the same information and add information to the case, to one case together. So you're not all processing the same things individually, you're putting it all together. That's how I would do it. If I was working in a team to get through these six cases, I have plenty of uh, GCP codes. So you should 100% be able to, if you wanna go down the road of, of collaborating, absolutely able to. Any questions?
All right, well, seeing and hearing none, then off we go to work. Again, use Discord, work together. We have a little more than a month to uh, solve all six cases. Ping me on Discord whenever you need help.